G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today on the channel we'll have a tutorial in Rhino Inside where we'll develop a decorative or wavy screen facade and bring it into Revit as native adaptive components. So it's going to look a little bit like this thing on the right here, but we'll have a fair bit of control over the shapes of this outcome, and we'll make sure that we place Revit native components at the end. So we're going to take a base surface, in this case a wall, we're going to be using graph mappers in Grasshopper, as well as uh, applying them to domains and vectors in order to create this outcome. Finally, we're going to take these points and turn them into an adaptive panel and place this in Revit. So I'll be using Autodesk Revit 2022, Rhino 7, and of course Rhino inside Revit. Um, it, it's assumed knowledge you'll understand basically how Revit, Grasshopper, and Rhino side, inside work. I will cover bits and pieces as I go, um, highlighting how each of these uh, platforms is working. Uh, and as well as this, I'll assume you have a very basic knowledge of domains of surfaces, so the U and the V aspects of surface mapping. Uh, but again, I'll explain it as I go. Uh, but if you do have a little bit of a basic understanding, it can help. Anyway, um, let's jump straight in. So I'm going to go straight into Revit. So we're aiming to do something a little bit like this. So we have an adaptive three-point component, which we'll, we'll build a little bit later on. And we can see it's got uh, a wave both in plan and also in uh, elevation. This would be very hard to do typically in Revit. I don't believe adaptive components would be able to achieve this easily using a conceptual mass. Um, probably could, uh, but generally I would recommend that using something like Grasshopper makes a lot more sense, especially if you can program your algorithm to create different outcomes. So I'm just going to create a new Revit model, and that's the component we'll be using. I'm just going to use an empty model in this case, and I'm just going to model just a wall. Uh, it doesn't really matter how big the wall is, make it maybe roughly the size that a decorative screen might occupy, let's say maybe uh, nine meters by three or four high. And I'm just going to make sure I'm working on the exterior face of the wall, just one particular face. Um, so in this case, I'm going to go into Rhino inside straight away. I'm going to start Rhino. And I'm just going to take a base input from the model, which is going to be this surface of the wall. And from there, we're mostly going to be working inside Rhino until we return our output into Revit. So I'm going to boot up Rhino um, inside Revit. And then I'm also going to boot up Grasshopper. Maximize my 3D viewport so we can really just focus on what's happening. And I'm just going to boot up Grasshopper. So we'll split into Rhino and Grasshopper pretty soon. Um, with Revit just sitting behind in the background. So I think I've just been pushed behind the scenes there. Let's, um, yep, there we go. So uh, if you have Rhino inside installed, you'll have these tools here, but you should also have a Revit tab where a majority of the tools we'll be using are coming from. I'm just gonna make a new script and save as, I'll just call this demo. Um, so the first thing we want to do is collect a face, um, in this case, uh, from the Revit model. So we use this using Rhino inside um, under, I believe, the Revit tab. We should be able to collect a face. And we're going to right click, select one face and pick our face. And at this point, we should have geometry in Rhino representing that face. So we're going to mostly be viewing our output using this window here. And I'm just going to maximize Grasshopper for as much space as possible. There we go. So uh, what we should have at this point is a face, um, but we can basically work with this as a piece of geometry in Rhino, a surface. Um, so we can see if we pass this to a surface node, we're dealing with an untrimmed surface, but any other node that deals with geometry with surfaces will usually auto convert this into a surface for us. For now, I'm just gonna centralize my data into a surface. Um, I'm also now going to deal with what's called the ISO curves of the surface. These are the framing curves that represent the edge of the uh, untrimmed representation of the surface. And in this case, we should have an untrimmed surface, which means that its edges are effectively the edges of its domain. So I'm gonna create a point. Um, in this case, I'm just gonna create a standard point at zero, zero to get the UV of zero and zero for the ISO curve references. And what this should give us is both the short curve and the long curve along the edge of these, which we can use to actually start generating points along these edges. So what I'm going to do now is divide, in this case, my curve. And I'm going to be dividing uh, the U curve in this case, which is the bottom curve. And now we have the ability to create a slider. So we'll go maybe 5 to 15 to 30. And we can control the number of divisions we place along this curve. So we can see now this is a flexible uh, parametric input into our script. And these are going to be the bottom of each of the blades that we're trying to place. So from here, we're going to be doing a few things. The first thing we're going to do is try to uh, push these points outwards um, in both directions. So we're going to move them up um, by a wave, and then we're going to push them out by a curve. 
So to do this, we're going to be using a very special node, in this case called a graph mapper. So graph mappers are quite interesting. They can do a lot of really creative things. Um, what I'm going to do first is use a domain node, and I'm going to construct a domain. So I'm going to use the same number of points as those that I'm placing. Sorry, not a domain, a range, um, which is going to give me a domain of 0 to 1, which is going to be in the U direction. I'm going to be applying this, um, and I'm going to divide it by the same number of divisions that I'm dividing this point at. So now we have a reference that we can place along a graph. So as soon as I plug this in and right click and pick a graph type, let's in this case uh, maybe pick a sine wave. Sine waves allow you to basically create a repeating waveform. And what we're gonna get here is basically an X and a Y reference uh, for um, each parameter at that point. So I'm actually dividing this graph into lines by the number of points that are coming out of this domain, working from zero to one, and I can then return a corresponding Y coordinate along that point, which I can use to do various things. So let's, for example, just apply this to a Z vector moving up. And I'm gonna multiply this by a particular magnitude. So I'll build a scale, just a scale reference such as five, and we'll start playing with that. Um, if I apply this to a movement, I can actually change these points in that direction. Now I probably need this, this to be a bit bigger. Yeah, there we go, we're starting to see a bit more. Uh, we'll make it the height, so we'll match our domain. So we can see now we're actually getting a, a wave on the displacement of these points in the vertical direction. So we can see now we're able to create various types of graphs to dictate how these points should be distributed in the Z direction to match this graph. So let's go back to, in this case, our sine wave. And maybe we'll increase this just a little bit so we have a little bit more um, matching along the curve. It's not as faceted in nature. Um, what we're gonna be doing with this is uh, multiplying basically by the length of the other side of the surface. So we know this is going to be, sorry, the length of our vertical curve. And this will distribute these points dynamically. So if our wall in Revit gets bigger, we're always gonna be working within the vertical size to match the domain of our graph mapper. So this should always be within the domain of our surface. And we can see that it is. If I go right to the top, it goes right to the top of the surface. So that's effectively our first graph mapper applied. Um, the next graph mapper we'll be using will push the points out away from the surface instead. So to do this, I'm going to firstly get the normal of my surface so I know which direction I'm pushing my points. So I'm gonna use an evaluate surface node, which will let me check the normal um, of my surface. It doesn't really matter where I check the normal because it's a flat surface. So in this case, I'm just gonna be checking pretty much anywhere. Um, generally the best place to check I find is just the middle. So we'll do an X and a Y or a U and a V um, of 0.5. And I'm also gonna re-parameterize my surface. So I'm working within the domain of the surface. So I can see now my point is right in the middle of the UV domain. Now at this point, I'm going to be returning a normal or a direction which, which can, we can see is pointing away from the Y axis, which is currently the direction the wall is facing. But this means if the wall's not facing in a predicted direction, we can ask it its direction of facing. So this will work uh, dynamically. From here, we're now gonna be able to move our points um, in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna create another graph mapper. And again, I'm gonna work by the same number of divisions because we have the same number of points. And this time I'm gonna do uh, a curve. I might do either a conic or maybe a parabola. I'll do a parabola. So we wanna sort of swell outwards like this. So I'm gonna create a just a curve shape like this. And we wanna push our points out to match this. And what we can do now is take these values and remap them to a minimum and a maximum desired distance. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just get the bounds of my output so that we're not really dealing with the, the um, extents of this. We're dealing with the minimum to the maximum swell. And now I wanna remap my values from, in this case, these values based on the minimum and the maximum, so we're not really dealing with the y extent, we're just dealing with the difference between the proportion of these points in depth. This is my source domain, and then we can build a target domain. So this will be the minimum and the maximum lift from the surface. So I'm gonna create a domain between, um, I'm working in millimeters here, so let's say our minimum blade depth is 100 millimeters. I'll go um, zero up to, and I'll pick 100, and let's say our maximum is a meter. Whoops. Try that again. 
So this can be my minimum and this can be my maximum. So let's say my maximum is going to be maybe 600 in this case. So what we've now done is remapped our values uh, to this extent. So our minimum in this range is going to be 250 and our maximum is going to be 600. So at this point or roundabout, you're gonna get a 600 millimeter deep blade and back here, you're gonna get a 250 millimeter deep blade. So we have full control over the outputs here. Um, I'm also now just going to move in this case by that. So what I can do is actually combine these into a common vector. Instead of translating once, I can actually put them together. Um, so I have these points here, which are in the middle, but I actually want to move them out. So I'm actually going to create a different point here. Um, I want to move these points up to the top to get the top. So I'm going to take, uh, in this case, this to get these top points because that's going to be the top of my blade. Now we're trying to find the middle that's pushed out and also pushed up in two common vectors. So I'm going to multiply in this case in the direction of the normal. So I'm going to take my normal vector and multiply it by this value. And now I'm going to combine these vectors together. Now I can take these points and what I might do is just create a, a relay here just to keep things a little bit neater. And I'm gonna move, in this case, those points by that vector instead. And now we can see that we're able to apply two vector movements in one. So we're not only moving the points up, but we're also moving the points out in a combined vector. What I wanna do now is merge these points together in three. So I'm gonna use, in this case, the entwine node to bring these two together, or these three things together. So we're gonna start first with our bottom point. We're then gonna take our top point, I believe. Yep, we'll take our top point. And finally, our bottom point. And what we should have now is three branches on a data tree. Yes, so what we wanna do now is flip matrix to put these all onto sub branches together. So these are gonna be in threes effectively. So we can see we have sets of points. And these are gonna represent the points of an adaptive component that we place in Revit. And I'll just simplify my output just to make sure that we're working at single branch level. There we go. So these are going to inform the placement of this. Now let's preview these first just to see what we're dealing with. So I'm gonna do a polyline by these points and I'm also just going to get a Boolean. And I'm just gonna say, I do want to close these curves. We can send this into a surface node in order to patch these. So now we can see what's happening here. And finally, we can just do a custom preview to give this a color. And I'll just turn off some of these, some of these previews. We'll get a swatch. And in this case, I'll just pick uh, maybe something quite bright, like a green, a green shade. So I can go back as well and turn off all these previews too, just so we're really only seeing, in this case, our, our wall. And maybe I also just want to turn off my surface, my ISO curves. I could potentially hide my surface too, but I'll keep that on for now. So we can see now we have the ability to go back and dynamically modify this geometry. So if I come in here and I pick a different waveform, we notice we can start to really change the shape of this. And we can use different graph types. We can really bunch it up, obviously at a certain point the number of points you make is not going to reflect the shape because you're not going to be moving smoothly along the curve. But as I get closer to a, a more subtle curve, you really start to notice that curvature from different directions. Likewise, I can really shallow out my curve if I want to, or I can make it a more extreme ratio. I can change where the curve bulges the most. Maybe at the start it's bulging or at the end. Um, I can also really you know, slender down this form from not quite zero, maybe like 50 up to 150 if I want a much more subtle, subtle screen. Or maybe I can really increase my intensity to a lot of divisions because I want to reflect a more chaotic pattern. So maybe I want to really go up and then you can start to start to reflect a more, a more dense pattern as a result. So it's a really flexible algorithm um, that I find is, is really interesting. Graph mappers are very useful in trying to create quite complex ge geometric outcomes. Uh, that would usually be very difficult in most software platforms. So I'm just going to take this down to about maybe 30. 
30 divisions and we'll go from say 200 up to 600 and we end up with an outcome like this. So how do we get this back into Revit? Well, we're going to be placing an adaptive component. So what we have here is a sublist of three points, which is going to be the bottom, the top and the middle point um, of this panel. So let's go and create a triangular adaptive component in Revit. So I'm just going to minimize Rhino, leave it in the background and let's make a new family. And I'm going to just make a generic model adaptive family. So we're going to place three points and you can place them anywhere. It doesn't really matter. So we'll go bottom, top, middle, select them all and make them adaptive. I'm going to select two points at a time, connect them, create reference. And I'm just going to do that a few times. That's so we can reuse these lines. If we have a need, we don't consume them in the geometry creation process. Whoops. We don't want that to look like that. There we go. Now I can select these three lines, create form, solid form, and I can create either a flat element or an extrusion. And I do want to create an extrusion. So in this case, I'm just going to make this uh, 25 negative, uh, sorry, 25. So we're going either side of the plane and I'm just going to associate a parameter here called half, half thickness. I'm going to associate it both sides. You can of course assign a material parameter if you want to as well. And then I'll set a thickness parameter. Let's say this is 50. And now I can say the half thickness is thickness on two. I'll just call this family typical. And I'm just going to save this family. And I'll just call this adaptive three point blade. I'm going to load this down into my model so it is available. Uh, go back to 3D and I'm going to get Rhino inside back on my screen. So at this point, we do want to use a little bit of Rhino inside. Um, we're going to be picking a family type. So if I go to the Revit tab, I believe it's under input. Um, I think it's component families picker. Yes. Um, so now I can look for adapt div and it, yeah, there it is. So I'm going to be picking in this case, this family. Now this is a family, not a type. So what I'm going to do now is get the types of the family. And we should only have one. Yep. But if you want to be absolutely sure you only get one, you can always list item at zero, which is the default, which means the first item in the list is the family type that we will get. From here, um, we're going to be using the build add component adaptive. Um, generally, it's up to you what mode you want to run this in. You can do tracking mode. So you can say, don't track. You can replace it when it changes or you can update the elements that were placed originally. Um, personally, I usually just work with disabled so that once it places, it makes the element and then it breaks the relationship in Rhino inside to the element. It's sort of like baking in Rhino if you've done that before. So I'm going to create here a stream filter, which is only going to send through the family type when I either hit a Boolean or hit a button. I'm going to do a button in this case. And this button will just be send to Revit. So when I hit this button in Rhino, once it's going to send through the family type, which means this will trigger once, place the components, then the script should finish. Now there are some errors I found in Rhino inside where sometimes you might freeze up the whole session of Revit when you bake things in, especially with direct shapes. I found adaptives, they're not usually too bad. So you might get variable results sometimes. So in this case, we're currently sending through no family type. So the node should be in an error state. It will fail to collect the data. But what we can do now is just make this a little bit smaller. And actually for now, let's put this into um, update mode. And let's just put a Boolean toggle here instead. So we can actually dynamically send changes back to the model. So as soon as I set this to true, we can see now we've actually got these families placed in a corresponding way to Rhino. So what I can actually do now is start to make changes, maybe 100 and maybe down to 300. And what I might do is put myself into lock mode and modify some of these things and then unlock. So it reruns and we can see we're able to send dynamic changes back to the Revit model um, very quickly and very easily. Maybe I want to pick a different type of graph for how we're actually going to place this curve. Maybe I want to use in this case a conic, conic fall off. 
and I'm able to send a different pattern to Revit. Maybe I want to use a different method of uh, bulging out the form. Maybe I want to do something more like a sine wave. Um, so in this case, I'll pick a, a sine wave and I'll bring it in a little bit. Now, sometimes notice it's really slow when I just did that. So what's happened there is um, I am just running without locking Rhino and that can sometimes be a little bit slow. Um, I often do prefer to change my inputs and then unlock Rhino just because it's a lot faster. So let's make a more dense sine wave in plan. And we can see that in plan, we're starting to get that sine wave pattern. So this is um, just, just a little tutorial, mainly on graph mappers, but I, I use these a lot in, um, in computational design. They are very powerful to create mathematic relationships along surfaces, um, often with facades, screening, attraction. There's all sorts of things you can do with them. Um, so this is just one application, but using Rhino Inside as a means to create a more complex outcome in the Revit model. Um, now you could easily adjust this graph to work on a curve as well. Um, all you would have to do is assess these, these points along the curve instead and move them at a list of normals. So I might just do that now actually. So if I create a curved wall in plan, I'm pretty sure this should be pretty easy to do. I'll make sure it's pointing outwards, which it should be. So I'll go to finish face exterior. There it is, it's pointing out. Um, so I'm going to just pause my script and what I'm gonna do now is pick this face. And we're going to want to find out the normal at each point so that when we send these normals through, we're not just sending one normal, we're sending them all here and multiplying them out in slightly different directions. So we can very easily do this. Um, all we have to do is just send through, in this case, uh, these domain points to our X domain. And then on the Y domain, it doesn't really matter where we put it. And I'm pretty sure this should allow us to just put these onto a curvature. And there we go. It's on a curvature. So um, it's pretty flexible, um, can do some really funky things. I think it's a very um, great example for Rhino Inside and a really useful use case for it. I have done some screens a little bit like this before um, that would not have been easy in Revit. Um, we've just done that in about what, 10 minutes or so, so um, really powerful. So I hope that's been a useful uh, demonstration, especially if you're trying to figure out applications for Rhino Inside. So you can find um, this script and other ones over on my GitHub. Um, there's lots of good stuff over there, check it out. Um, and if you're not already following and subscribing the, to the channel, feel free to do so. I release videos about once a week and aim to do so for a long time. Um, if you have any requests, um, let me know and I'll let you know if I can fulfill the request. I can't do everything, um, but I try to do what I can or what I know. Um, and I will reply to every comment as well. So I look forward to seeing you in future similar videos. Uh, thanks. Take care. Bye.